This lesson deals with dynamic resistance and a voltage controlled attenuator. You can find these notes in the ECE302 ebook in chapter 2 starting on page 14. Suppose that we take a real diode and put a voltage across it that is made up of an AC component and a DC component. In other words, this is a pure sine wave and this is just a DC battery. The voltage across the diode would just be the sum of these two voltages. I'll explain some notation electronics. We use lowercase letters with uppercase subscript to indicate any voltage or current versus time. We use an uppercase letter and an uppercase subscript to indicate pure DC. And we use a lowercase letter and a lowercase subscript to indicate pure AC. That's a little bit different than ECE202 when we had phasor notation. But this will be our phasor notation for ECE302 in any electronics course. And I want to show that the current, if the voltage V sub D is very small, is also the sum of a DC and an AC component. Let me do that graphically. Suppose that we make this AC voltage source go to zero. In other words, the amplitude is zero. Then the voltage across the diode is just a DC value. That's going to give us a corresponding value of current. Now we're going to denote this in this course with a Q subscript. It's called a Q point or quiescent point. I like to call it the quiet point. Let me explain this a few minutes here. Now let's take the tangent to this point. Now suppose you put that AC voltage source back in and that the voltage here starts to increase. Let's say it's a sine wave. Then the total voltage across the diode begins to increase. Now this picture doesn't have time on it. Let's do the following. Let's take the voltage axis and let's project time this way. And likewise, the current axis and project time this way. The voltage starts to increase and correspondingly the current starts to increase. We eventually reach a peak for the value of V sub D and the corresponding voltage across the, the diode itself, and then correspondingly the current. And then this decreases, and then this decreases. If this signal is small enough, then the variation here is somewhat straight line or linear. In other words, the slope here doesn't change dramatically. It does over larger changes in current. And so what I'm left with then, given a DC voltage and an AC voltage added together, I have a DC current, and then I have an AC current riding on top of it. Suppose that the AC signal here starts to increase slightly. In other words, just a little bit higher here and a little bit lower here. The corresponding current, because there isn't much of a change in the slope here, would correspondingly increase and then decrease. So we get a linear response in this small neighborhood as the AC term varies. Let's see if we can show this mathematically. The current in the diode at any instant of time is the Shockley equation, but we know we're in the first quadrant. We could throw that minus one away. The current in the diode versus time is I sub S times E, and this would be the voltage across the diode divided by eta V sub T. Now we're applying a DC voltage and a very small AC voltage. As I mentioned previously, if we let the AC component shrink to zero, then the voltage across the diode is just the DC voltage. I call that also the quiet point besides the quiescent point, because this is saying that if we had music, the music is set equal to zero, and all we've got is a DC result. We really can't hear DC. It's the change in voltage that we hear through a speaker. Under those conditions, I have that I sub D of T, as we showed on that graph, is just equal to the DC value of current, which we're using in an uppercase letter, an uppercase subscript, and then we're using the extra subscript here of Q to indicate it's the quiescent point. It's really the value on the average. This can be equal to our Shockley equation evaluated when V sub D is just purely DC. V sub D is equal to a DC plus an AC term. And we could write this exponential as the product of two exponentials and add up their exponent. So here's I sub S. And let's take these two terms together. E raised to the V sub DQ over A to V sub T times what's left over, which is E raised to the V sub D of T over A to V sub T. This term here we've already defined as I sub DQ. The current in the diode any instant of time is the operating point times an exponential which is changing with time. If we call it calculus, we had some power series expansions, one of which was for e to the x, and that's equal to one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial and so on. If x is small, in other words, less than one in magnitude, then squaring it makes it even smaller, and then dividing by a number greater than one makes it smaller, and likewise for this. These terms would have very little effect if the magnitude of x were less than 1. We could approximate e to the x as 1 plus x. Our value for the current i of d of t is i sub dq. This is our value of x. It would be equal to 1 plus v sub d of t 
over a to v sub t. Again, this is our ac or result as a function of time. Multiply that out, so I've got 1 times i dq, and then i dq times v sub d of t over a to v sub t. And what is this? This is a dc term, and this is an ac term. So we can call this little i sub little d of t. And again, this is true provided that x, which is v sub d of t over a to v sub t, is less than 1. Let me rewrite i of d of t in the following. It's equal to v sub d over a to v sub t, and then I'm going to multiply it by i sub d cube. But let me write this as 1 over 1 over, down over here. What I've got is that current is equal to voltage divided by a constant. Sounds like Ohm's law, but because these are both AC terms, then this would be an AC resistance. We're going to call that the dynamic resistance for AC circuit analysis. And that's going to be equal to A to V sub T over I sub DQ. Now, how does R sub D relate to the picture we had on the previous page? Let's find the slope of the Shockley equation and evaluate that at the operating point. Take the partial derivative of the Shockley equation. Again, let's throw the one away because we're in the first quadrant with respect to V sub D. So here's a scalar in front. Then we're going to take the derivative of E to the AX with respect to X. And that's going to be A, E to the AX. And so here's my E to the AX. But A is 1 over A to V sub T. Evaluating that at the operating point, V sub DQ, we then get I sub S over A to V sub T times E to the V DQ over A to V sub T. And then take the i sub s and put that together with the exponential. That's our definition for i sub dq divided by a to v sub t, and that is our definition of r sub d reciprocal. So the slope at the q point, the vi characteristics of a diode, is 1 over r sub d. If we have a circuit with a dc signal along with a very small ac signal, then the resulting voltages and currents can be found in the following way. We'll put a dc model in for each component, and find the DC operating point, in other words, the Q point. In our case for a diode, that's I sub DQ and V sub DQ. We'll then use that to calculate an AC model, and then we'll put an AC model in for each component of the circuit and find the AC response. And then if V sub D is less than A to V sub T, then we can simply add the two results together. Now this sounds like superposition, but it isn't. It's really the Taylor series expansion where we're throwing away the squared and cubed in, in terms that are higher powers. Let's do an example to see how we might use this. Here we've got a circuit with two capacitors, three resistors, a real diode, and an AC voltage source that's small. In this case, it's 10 millivolts times the sine of omega t. Here I've got two capacitors I'm showing approaching infinity in value. What does that mean? Well, the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over j omega c, and the magnitude is just 1 over omega c. And if c is approaching an extremely large number, then 1 over that is a very small number, no matter what the value of omega is, except for 0, which would be dc. So for any frequency, if I have an infinitely large capacitor, I have an impedance of that capacitor that's a short circuit, and the capacitor is also an open circuit for dc. Obviously, we can't buy an infinitely large capacitor, but we'll learn later in the course how to pick the value, depending on the bandwidth we want in our circuit. But for right now, just say it's a big capacitor. Now, suppose that I apply a voltage here that's either 2 volts or 10 volts, and current will flow and they'll put the diode in the first quadrant. Let's assume that the value of the voltage across the diode is about 0.7 volts. Could you find the voltage across the diode versus time and the output voltage versus time? Let's use our four step algorithm for solving this problem for the case of V sub C being equal to two volts. So the first step is to find the DC operating point. And we're gonna do that by putting in a DC model for each component. What's the DC model for a capacitor? Well, it's an open circuit. Even though it's a large capacitor, it's still going to be an open circuit for DC. Our AC voltage source has an average value of zero, and that's what DC means. A resistor is still a resistor for a DC circuit, and of course a DC voltage source is still a DC voltage source. But what about the diode? We haven't talked about modeling the diode. We're going to do it a little bit later in this chapter, but right now we're saying the voltage across here is around 0.7. That really means on the average it's 0.7. We're going to see it varying a little bit. I'm just going to consider this to be the DC voltage value here of 0.7. I'm going to call that V sub DQ. What's the current flowing in here? We need to know what that is. This is an open circuit, so there's no current here. There's an open circuit here, so there's no current here. And in fact, the voltage across here, DC-wise, is going to be 0 times 2K. We're going to be blocking the DC across here. The current that's in this resistor is the current in the diode. So this node voltage is 2. This node voltage is 0.7. So that difference divided by 2K is 650 microamps. That's my value of I sub DQ. The second step in our algorithm was to find the AC model. And that's A to V sub T over I sub DQ. For silicon, A is between 1 and 2. We're assuming here that's equal to 1. 
B sub T is around 26 millivolts at room temperature, and I sub D cube is 650 microamps. So you get about 40 ohms. Step three is to find the AC results. We're gonna put an AC model in for each component. An AC voltage source is still an AC voltage source, but what about a battery? We can think about AC resistance as the change in voltage over the change in current. The resistance of a DC voltage source would be that, but what's the change in voltage across a DC voltage source? Well, it's zero, but there is a change in current, current coming out of it, which is eventually gonna go into the diode, into the load. That ratio is equal to zero. A DC voltage source looks like a short circuit for AC. So going back to original schematic, the diode looks like a 40 ohm resistor for AC. The resistors are still resistors. The capacitors, because they are so large, look like short circuits for any frequency. And then we just have our AC voltage source. I want to solve for the AC voltage across here, which is actually the same as the voltage across here. What I've got are three resistors in parallel. They're both between the same two nodes. I've got 40 in parallel with 2K in parallel with 2K, and that's voltage dividing with 100 times Vn. 2K in parallel with 2K is 1K, and that in parallel with 40 is a little bit less than 40, maybe 39, but we can just kind of throw these terms away. In electronics, we can do a lot of approximations. If something is at least a factor of 10 times bigger, we could just ignore it. So I'm gonna throw these away and just say it's roughly equal to 40, and then likewise over here. If you wanna be more precise, you can calculate it exactly. That's gonna give me a value of 0.2857 times Vn. What's Vn? It's 10 times the sine of omega t. I'm multiplying 10 milli times this, we get 2.857 milli times the sine of omega t. V out and V sub d are the same for AC. Now, is this a small signal? Well, we have to show that V sub d is less than eta of V sub t. Now, V sub d is a sine wave and it's going positive and negative. So when it's negative, it's always gonna be less than eta V sub t. It's when it's positive, it's maximum value that we need to be concerned with. Now that's 2.857 millivolts and this being one in 26 millivolts, then this is small signal. So we can add the results together. Our voltage versus time for the diode and for the output has got a DC value of 0.7 and the injury notation now would be 700 millivolts plus 2.857 milli times the sine of omega t. The DC level is blocked by that capacitor and we just get zero there. We just have the pure AC signal of 2.857 milli times the sine of omega t. Let's now repeat these same four steps, but with V sub C equal to 10 volts. Value of I sub DQ now is the 10 volts, not the two, minus 0.7 over 2K, now it's 4.65 milliamps. We're going higher up on that VI characteristic. What happens to R sub D? A to V sub T over I sub DQ, one times 26 milli, now over 4.65 milliamps, I get 5.59. It went from 40 ohms to 5.59. We're going higher up on that curve and it's looking more and more like a short circuit. Our voltage divider now is 5.59 with 2K in parallel with 2K. But again, this is gonna be 1K and that's so much bigger than 5.59. So you could roughly throw this away. You just have 5.59 over 100 plus 5.59. That's a lot smaller number now. So multiplying that by Vn, I've got 529 micro times the sine of omega t for the AC term. Is that still small signal? Yes, 529 micro is the biggest this will ever be positive. And then of course, that's much less than 26 millivolts. You can add the DC and the AC results. So the voltage across the diode has a value of roughly 0.7 and then a sine wave riding on top of that. You know, put this in engineering notation. We're gonna block that DC level and just get the AC part out. So what's happening here? Well, as the DC voltage is going up, the AC voltage is going down. That's really a voltage controlled voltage divider. We call it attenuator. We're using pots for attenuators in ECE 201 and 202, but we can do it electronically by changing a DC voltage. We could do that remotely with a transmitter and a receiver, and we could vary something by not physically turning a shaft. And this is dynamic resistance and a voltage control attenuator.